following program is intended for mature audiences. The time is now for the hardest hit, yet completely trivial, football show on the planet. You are in rarefied territory. Ladies and gentlemen, well, well to the broken helmet. Let's rock. And coming to you live on tape on this Saturday, January 22nd, 2022. It's around noon Eastern Standard Time. The Broken Helmet coming to you on Divisional Weekend. That's right, we got through the shitty wild card weekend that was, which ended up having so much promise and just completely and utterly tanked. I mean, it was just... A mess, mess of a wild card weekend. Your best game was your first game on Saturday between the Raiders and the Bengals. And then after that, it just went all, I mean, it really did go all downhill. Gonzo. See you later. It just, uh, it just never got better. It was, uh, it was a shame. It was because there was just so much potential for having good games there. And it just didn't turn out that way. But is what it is. That is in the past. We are looking to the future. Well, the future is now. So it is the present, actually. And that being the four games we have lined up for the NFL Divisional Weekend. As I mentioned, we've got two games today, two games tomorrow. We've got a 4.30 and an 8 today. Then we have the odd, well, the shift to get closer to prime time tomorrow as we go 3 o'clock instead of 1 and 6.30 instead of 4. So you always see that shift when it comes down to the later playoff rounds. And so that begins tomorrow, Sunday at 3 instead of 1. So those are the uh, four time slots that we have. We've got the games to jump into. But before we do that, why don't we take a quick look. Some thematic things going into this week coming out of last week and we'll take a quick look at that in our first segment first down down. so when we talk about thematic things going into today's divisional games we look back at the wild card weekend the super wild card weekend that was not as we said was definitely not super it was a wild card weekend for sure super eh, not so much anyway when we look back at the wild card weekend and then the season that was The one thing that really stuck out was all year long what you saw were dogs coming in more so than favorites. And definitely of the dog coming in, the one significant bet was betting those dogs to straight up win. Because a huge percentage of the dogs that came in just outright won. So if you liked the dog, it was worth it for you to actually go on the money line and take that dog to win at the clip that they were coming in. The other item was that the unders were the majority of the results this year. And then you look at last weekend's wild card weekend, it couldn't have been more opposite. Last week was all favorites. They came in at 5-1, and one, and then the over-unders were just split at 3-3. Three and three. Those dogs, actually, you did see, well, I shouldn't say those dogs. There was one dog. The one dog that did notch the victory was the San Francisco 49ers. And like I just mentioned... They came in with the win. So if you liked the dog last week and you were a 49er fan and that was your bet, it paid to put that team on the money line rather than just taking them with the points. Now, the odd thing is, is when you look at teasers, the teasers really came in on the dogs all year. Teasers usually come in, you know, I mean, I shouldn't say usually, but... Let's say that they come in around the 65% mark on on a whole every year, you know, tracking the statistics for the past couple of years. If you do it week in and week out, what you usually see is that they float dogs, favorites, overs, unders. They float around the 65%, right? So the dogs being the leader in the clubhouse total for I mean you know talking about the games and the lines themselves just taking dogs them being the leader in the clubhouse obviously their teasers were doing better than the favorites well even the dogs that got smoked last week at a 
clip of 5-1 to one to the favorites. The teases didn't help them. That's what I'm driving at. That was a long <laughs> fucking way to go to say, even when you tease the dogs, they didn't really come in. The dogs last week were 2-4. and four. So even using the six points to your advantage or more if you wanted, I, I do everything with six points, but obviously you can get more if you want to give up on the odds. But the dogs at six came in at two and four. So the dogs, even though they had a great year, they ended up whiffing a little bit in the wild card weekend. Now, you want to go over to the tickets, sharps, and money. Well, it was also an inverse of what you had seen a lot over the year. During the year, the Sharps and the money were well above the tickets in terms of record. And then last week, what you had was the tickets at 5-1 and, and the money at 1-5. Uh, seriously, it's as though the Super Wild Card Weekend was super in the sense that it took everything that happened over the over the course of the year and flipped it and turned it on its head. <laughs> That's what really happened. So we will see going into the divisional round here, What ends up being the trend? Is it the wild card weekend trend of anti-season stats? Or is the seasonal large data set going to come through here and then reverse where the dogs come in this weekend and the unders come in where the favorites and the overs end up taking a a backseat? Don't know until the games are played. We'll see. I have a tendency right now of leaning toward it being more in line with the wild card weekend and it being a lot of chalk. We'll get to the games in a little bit, but that's my initial feeling right now. And we'll see at when it becomes Monday morning. Well, Sunday night, I guess. Late Sunday night, Monday morning, because that late game at 6 o'clock, that's not going to go into uh, the overnight, uh, unlike sometimes the night games do. So we'll know Sunday night what the results are. But anyway, that was a, a look at the gambling aspect. If we want to flip it, let's take a look at DVOA. And what you saw last weekend when going into it was there were several teams that were good on both fronts, both offense and defense. Looking through the lens of DVOA, which I tend to like and I tend to talk about, but the teams that had the better offense are existing more in this round than the defenses where you had a bunch of teams end up getting knocked out. So let's take a quick look at the defenses. The defenses, there were... Uh, let's see, of the total of the top 10 DVOA teams, we had one through nine that still existed in the playoffs going into last week. We had three of those teams get knocked out. So the first being the Dallas Cowboys. Obviously, they shit the bed versus San Francisco at home. You had the New England Patriots, who ended up not... I don't even know if they got off the plane. It didn't look so if you watched the game, as the Bills didn't have a punt in the single game and just racked up, what was it, seven touchdowns during the event. And then you had the Arizona Cardinals, who also got just thumped on the Monday night wild card weekend game. And they should go do away with that Monday night wild card. It's just too much football. I was super excited on seeing the Monday night game because Monday night football always had a pop to it, which I, me and my brother in a podcast probably had talked about it just kind of faded over time and I was really excited for it and then what ended up happening was the the Saturday and Sunday games were so bad that by the time you got to Monday Night Football you were just exhausted and then the Monday Night Football game was so bad too that it was just oh man we couldn't have done this over the weekend but I mean look either it's neither here nor there it's just I think I would rather actually have the third game on Saturday than having the Monday Night game uh, be Existing, I don't know. And I'm sure the teams would probably rather have everything wrapped up on Sunday and get that extra day's rest, especially those two teams that played on Monday night. But neither here nor there. That's a conversation for another time. And, and I don't know. I'm, who the hell really cares about TV anyway. That's kind of a boring subject, so uh, off that shit. Uh, Anyway, like we were saying, uh, Dallas, New England, and Arizona, all three of those teams had top 10 ranked DVOA defenses, and they're all gone. Dallas was two, New England was four, Arizona was six. On the flip side, you had eight of the top 10 DVOA offenses going into the weekend, and only 
two of those teams ended up losing. One being Dallas and the other being New England. New England and Dallas. I, I mean, if you wanted to talk about teams that came into the postseason with potential uh, based on season performance, uh, DVOA ranking, however you saw it, I mean, those two teams completely just missed the boat come wild card weekend. Dallas more so than New England. You know, New England went in to the wild card weekend and they were really struggling. The, the, all that momentum that they had when they had beat the Bills earlier in the year had all but dissolved as they just had shit game, good game, shit game. I mean, they just came in on such a slide and they were not playing well. And that carried over to that wild card weekend. Surprising for a Belichick team, especially one that had looked so good earlier in the year. But it is what it is, and that's what happened to the Patriots. Dallas, again, if there was a team that I was couldn't have been more wrong about, going into last weekend, the San Francisco 49ers were, what were they? They, they were underdogs by three points, I think. And I thought for sure that was going to be a Dallas win and a lock. I, I just couldn't understand everybody's rationale that the 49ers were going to go into that game and just play lights out while the... The Cowboys were going to struggle, but that's indeed what happened. Dallas came in there and continued their poor up-and-down performance of the second half of the season. San Francisco did play lights out from the get-go, and it ended up not netting the 49ers the victory. But anyway, Dallas and New England had two of the top offenses. Again, there was eight teams in the top 10 DVOA. Two of them got knocked out. So you still have Tampa Bay with the first-ranked offense, Green Bay at two, Kansas City at three, San Francisco at four, Rams at eight, and Buffalo at 10 existing. Meanwhile, on the defensive side of the ball, which we had talked about, you only have Buffalo at one, Rams at five, San Francisco at seven, and Tampa Bay at nine. So what you're seeing here, again, obviously can change week to week, but right now it's offenses in the playoffs that are coming through big, while the defenses, the, the defensive teams seeing that side of the ball it seems to have slipped a little bit, right? And so we'll see what happens here going in to the uh, championship weekend after we wrap up the divisionals here. So top defense is knocked out. Top offense is still going. And so then one of the other storylines is the passing of the guard, right? This weekend you are seeing some of the last hurrahs of the old regime being Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, and the introduction of the new regime. Or not introduction in the regards of Pat Mahomes, but he's one of the early, he's one of the younger cats. And then you have Joe Burrow and Josh Allen. Allen obviously been there before. Burrow has not. But overall Mahomes, Burrow and Allen, these are going to be the quarterbacks that lead the next, you know, 10 years of NFL offenses while Brady and Rodgers are probably on their last couple, right? I mean, well, who knows? I, <laughs> Brady could play till 50 if he keeps going like this. You never know with him. He keeps eating avocado, avocado toast, avocado ice cream, avocado somehow, you know, keep your your health and well-being going till the end of the age. Who would have known? You know, I, I, if I was growing up, I wish I just ate avocados now if that was... The uh, what the result was, you know, avocados from Mexico. Anyway, I don't know. I fucking digressed into a goddamn complete shit show there. So that's what happens uh, when you try to ad lib and come up with something creative, and you just got nothing in your fucking repertoire. You just end up crashing in the middle of a podcast. But anyway, like I was saying, avocados eat them. They're fucking good for you. But anyway, Rogers and Brady will be seeing you know retirement coming along the pike. But Mahomes, Burrow, and Allen will be there, thereby taking the NFL bus in and keep going. I'm going to use bus there for as a uh, nod to uh, nod to the great John Madden. So they're going to be driving the bus into the future here, and we're going to see that this weekend. And you could see an early passing of the baton here this weekend, as there are several people, experts, and you know, game pickers here that are looking at the Rams as a possible upset here of the Bucks, and that would show Mr. Brady the door here in the divisional round and also there are more so uh, more well more so no there are more people looking at the 49ers to possibly upset the Packers in that game which would thereby show Rodgers the door as well on divisional weekend so you could see an early uh, you know foreshadowing of the not it wouldn't be a foreshadow you stupid asshole you could see the early 
changeover here and the exit of the old regime if those two games go that way where the seniors that we talked about here in Brady and Rodgers are shown the door and do not get to uh, you know follow themselves to the championship game, which is what I, I would imagine everybody and their brother wants to see right now, right? If you were to look at these games and see what could be in the championship games, I mean, it's Rodgers, Brady's, Packers, Bucks in the championship game. That's what they want, right? If you want a game that nobody wants, it's Rams 49ers. Nobody and their brother wants that for the NFC weekend. And NFL especially doesn't want that. Which, keep in mind, when we watch these games, how those whistles go. Because, look, the refereeing has not been good. You have seen some things that have been very controversial. Just go to that Bengal Raiders game last weekend, that fucking whistle. You can't... You can't beat it with that one because that goddamn whistle was blown so before that ball passed. Now, I am not a Raider fan. Uh, I I did pick the Raiders in that one. Didn't matter. That whistle did not impact the effect of that play. That play was a touchdown any way, shape, or form that you cut it. He was open. That ball was thrown before he got out of bounds. The players, even though they did seem to quit at the last half second, that ball was getting completed, and that was a touchdown. However, that said, they blew that whistle. And when that blown, that play is dead. And you cannot put the genie back in the bottle. You cannot reverse time. There's no DeLorean that goes 88.7 miles per hour or whatever gigawatts. You can't do it. You can't go back in time. You blew the whistle, and that's the end of the play. Period. That's it. You can't defend letting the play stand because, I don't know, what was it? The whistle happened after the play... The pass was caught. Bullshit. That wasn't the case at all. So anyway, like I was saying, that whistle is just an example of some of the terrible officiating that has plagued this league all year long, and especially in that wild card weekend. So look for it this weekend and see if some of those questionable calls go the way of the Buccaneers and the Packers. Because let's be honest, that's what the NFL wants. Green Bay. Tampa Bay, in Green Bay for the championship weekend. But like I was saying, passing in the guard, we could see it here this weekend, and we will see some how that, the new kids perform, right? Especially Joe Burrow. I'm interested to see Joe Burrow and his performance here in week two of the playoffs. Mahomes, you've already seen it. Allen, look, I've not been an Allen fan. I can't keep shitting on the goddamn kid and keep picking against him because I keep saying, oh, you're going to see him return to form. You're going to see him go back to the way he was year one and year two. I, it just hasn't happened. So, you know, talk about, you know, having a buy I have got to get out of that anti Allen bias because you watch it on tape, and I rewatched that, that Buffalo game. He looked fantastic. He looked great. So I, I keep picking against him for no real reason, um, you know. And I got to get out of that. But we'll see. Allen, you know, has had a, a couple of years here. He had a monster game last week. So him, Mahomes, and Burrow look to be taking the baton. So anyway, those are the them- some of the thematic things going in to this weekend's games. And with that said, let's jump right into it. Second down. And we will start with the Saturday games. The first game will be played at 4.30 Saturday at Nissan Stadium. The game will be on CBS, and you will be seeing the Tennessee Titans hosting the Cincinnati Bengals. Right now, the Titans are four-point favorites at home. The over-under is 47.5 points. We want to hop over to see where the gambling stats are currently. Currently, it is a trifecta, baby. The Titans have the Sharps, the Tickets, and the Money all on their side. Tickets are currently at 61% of the ticket pool is on Tennessee, while 82% of the money is on the Titans. So, flip over DVOA. We'll take the Titans on offense, the Bengals on defense to start it off. The Titans right now are ranked, well, all of these DVO stats, statistics, DVOA statistics are from Football Insiders and they're all based on the end of the year. I did not redo them for the to factor in the playoff weekend because I, you know, it, the rest of the teams didn't play. It screws up the the uh, consistency of the statistics, if you will. So everything that I quote here and for the following three games are going to be end of the year DVOA statistics complements of 
football outsiders. Anyway, like I said, Titans on offense, Bengals on defense. Titans offense was ranked 20th, 21st against the 21st in the pass and 7th on the ground. Now, obviously, that 7th probably could have been a lot stronger had Derrick Henry not seen the sidelines for the second half of the week, and he will be coming back this week. We'll talk about that in a second. And they did that 20th ranked offense against the 6th ranked schedule. Bengals, meanwhile, are 19th on defense, 24th against the pass, 13th against the run, and they did that against the 14th ranked schedule. Flip it over, and let's go on the other side of the ball. When the Bengals are on offense, they were ranked 18th. That was 15th in the air, 20th on the ground against the 31st uh, rank schedule, so obviously a weak schedule of teams that that offense went against in terms of the defenses they went against. And then the Titans are 12th in defense, 11th against the pass, 14th on the run against the 24th ranked schedule. So pretty even even Steven, uh, you know, if you look at it, Titans offense 20, Bengals defense 19, flip it over, Bengals offense 18, Titans defense 12. So not a lot to gleam there from the DVOA rankings, but if they say anything, it hopes to be a very good game. Let's flip over to the injury reports right now, Bengals at the Titans Right now, one of the keys in this game is going to be that Bengals defensive line versus the Titans run game, especially with Derrick Henry being back this week. Now, the Bengals defensive line took a hit last week when Larry Ogan Joby got knocked out. He went out, I think it was the ankle and the knee, but he went out and he will not be in this week. Trey Hendrickson, meanwhile, he got a concussion, but he is going to actually be back, so they get a bonus there. But there's other injuries along that line. Mike Daniels is dealing with a groin injury, and Josh Tupo has a knee injury. So that Bengals defensive line is banged up for this game against a return of Derrick Henry. Now, we don't know what to expect out of Derrick Henry in this one. Maybe he returns to form. Maybe he's not. Maybe they have to lean on Tannehill and the pass offense uh, more more so than the run offense. Who knows? You're going to find out going into it. However, if Henry is a full go, there looks to be a little bit of opportunity there with a banged up Bengals defensive line. So, how does the game shake out? All those thing, all these things considered, you know, right now I definitely have a lean on the Titans. The Titans and the four points is going to be my pick. Bengals have been a great story. And I definitely think that the opportunity is there for the Bengals to air it out this this weekend and get the win. I acknowledge that possibility is there. You look at the Titans and you look at their defense, and they surrendered more than 245 pass yards per game. There were only eight teams in the league that had done so, them being one of them. right? So the opportunity is there for Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, along with the other wideouts, you know, you, you have Tyler Boyd plus uh, T. Higgins to gain some yardage through the air there and really test that weak Tennessee uh, pass defense. So, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to be enough. I, I think what is stuck in my crawl right now is thinking back to last week's wild card weekend and the fact that the Raiders, albeit how bad they played, were still in that game in the end. And as I had mentioned about the a whistle that went off, if you had removed that touchdown, who knows, maybe they get the touchdown I, you, somewhere else, the game plays out different, it, it's tough to kind of remove something and think about how it would turn out because I, you know, it just doesn't happen that way. But the game was close, right? There was a controversial whistle. There were a lot of things that went the Bengals' way, yet the Raiders were still alive, right? So now they have to go on the road. If you want to talk about weird, bad stats, the Bengals have never, never won a road playoff game in franchise history. Never! They are 0 for 7. So they've had 7 games. Game 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Fast forward to 7. You get the picture. So it's not a statistic that you want on your side. Granted, nothing in the past 
continues on to the future. All of these games are played independent of themselves. So using old school statistics like that really don't have any relevancy outside of the fact that maybe it is something cosmic uh, that has carried on and plagued these teams. But eventually, the Bengals are going to win a road on the playoff game. It's not going to be over their entire lives. Uh, well, the entire life of the franchise, that is. But, uh, you know, for this game, if you like things like that, the Bengals are 0-7 on the road in franchise history in the playoffs. Um, you know, as for the Titans, you know, again, I think... The reason that I like them so much is, as I mentioned, that the Bengals were a little rough um, you know, to close out a game that they really should have won. And the Titans, for the year, played so much better than I had expectations, especially when they lost Derrick Henry. Vrabel had that team lined up to do their weekly duties one way, the same way, every week. It was going to be Derrick Henry, a little smattering of of uh, Ryan Tannehill, and then their defense was going to try not to implode. And they did that spectacularly, and then they lost Derrick Henry. And then they still, still finished the season as the number one seed and got the, the first round by. Right, so they finished it off. They got the week one by top seed, finished eleven and five. I mean, more than you would have thought when you lost somebody of the significance of Derrick Henry. So, I I'm going to lean toward the Mike Vrabel coached Titans to win here at home versus a Bengals team that has so much good future in front of them but had a little bit of difficulty closing out a, a Raiders team that really played like shit and, and and should have just gotten throttled. Now the Bengals have to pack up, hit the road, and go into Tennessee and try to repeat that performance or better that performance to get the victory. And I don't know if that can be done. The spread is four. I would have liked it more at three. But here, what I'm thinking is that the Titans end up netting this this game by a score of four and more. The over-under is 47 and a half. I don't know if I can even lean at that anyway, because I think that is as, as good as it's going to get for a game like this. I guess I would probably lean maybe a little bit to the under. It would be over if you were to know, if you would know ahead of time that the Bengals offense was going to start humming Chase and Higgins and Boyd and Burrow were going to go off, but you just don't know that. And I'm not quite sure I can get behind uh, you know, a, a I, I'm just going under. I, I'm going to fucking sit here and, and flounder trying to come up with stuff to say. Fuck it. I'm taking. I'm taking the under. I just. I, I. That's the way that I'm leaning in this game. So I like the Titans and the four, and I like the under at forty-seven and a half. And the second game on Saturday, which will be played at 8.15 at Lambeau Field. This game will be the lone game on Fox for the weekend. And it's going to feature the Green Bay Packers hosting the San Francisco 49ers. Packers finished the year 13-3, while the 49ers landed at 9-7. Packers obviously finished top of the NFC, got the bye last week. 49ers went on the road in wildcard weekend, beat up on the Cowboys, as we, as we had discussed. Now, this game is going to see Green Bay as five and a half point favorites currently at Lambeau. The biggest spread on the Sunday, Saturday docket uh, of all these games, the Titans game that we just talked about was the second uh, spread at four. So five and a half here in favor of the Packers over San Francisco. Over under is at 47 points. Check out the gambling stats. The Sharps have not picked a side yet and the tickets and the money are on opposite sides. So the tickets right now are at 57% in favor of Green Bay and the money is 65% in favor of San Francisco. So you have the pros versus Joes in this game here. So we'll head over to the injury report and see what the deal is there for the 49ers and Packers. There's not a lot. Nick, the 49ers are going to have Nick Bosa playing today. They are going to have Jimmy Garoppolo playing. Garoppolo obviously had the thumb and the shoulder injury. They didn't know he was going to play last week. He played. Then he had the shoulder injury in the game. He's going to play this weekend too. Bosa had the concussion, but it looks like he is good to go. Packers have a 
you know, a couple of questionable uh, notables here. Questionable notables. That's what they have. And that being Bakhtiari and Jari Alexander. So Alexander has not played since week four. He might get in this game. Bakhtiari, I, you know, he played a little bit in the week 18 game and it didn't seem like it helped out. Uh, you know, he has been struggling to get back here on the field for weeks on end since they activated him and he just hasn't been able to do it. And it's going to be a question of whether or not he goes in this game. Jari Alexander, obviously they played without him since week four, so it would just be a bonus. They've learned to play without him. They've learned to play without Bakhtiari too. Um, So, like we have talked about on the podcast during the year, the injuries are a bigger factor intra-game or if it's a late scratch than it is trying to plan around people that have been out or that were out early, you know, in the week that you just knew how to plan around it. So, you know, them not being able to go here in this game since they've been out forever isn't really a big loss. Uh, Van Scantling, he is a, a doubtful with his back injury, but they're getting Randall Cobb back, so it's kind of a give and a take in that regard. So let's head over to the the DVOA side of things and check out where these two teams line up. With the Packers on offense, they ranked second in offense, going against the 16th ranked schedule. The 49ers defense, meanwhile, was 7th, and their stronger suit was obviously that defensive front that gave the Cowboys fits last weekend. That's the second ranked DVOA run defense uh, powered by that front. So the Packers number 2 on offense, 49ers 7th on defense. You flip the the sides around there. The 49ers ranked 5th on offense, while the Packers ranked 22nd on defense. So if you want to call, talk about discrepancies, there it is right there. You got the 49ers offense, which even with Garoppolo in there, has been good all year long. 5th in the pass, 5th in the run. Uh, they did so against a 25th you know, ranked schedule, but you, know, you saw last week, that was the number 1 DVO ranked defense going into the, well, number two, sorry, uh, Buffalo was number one, but Dallas was number two, and San Francisco chopped them up. So it doesn't really matter. That 49ers offense is solid. And so they are going against a, a questionable, questionable Packers defense that came in 20 seconds DVOA. So, you know, now let's take a, a look at the game. I think that this game really is going to be how much can Shanahan really power this team, you know, through his exceptional, exceptional coaching prowess. Uh, You know, he's going up uh, against Matt LaFleur on the other side, who many people have not been a fan of. Obviously, him and Rodgers have butted heads. But the 49ers have gotten to this point through... Kyle Shanahan and Kyle Shanahan alone. And I I guess you could say, you know, acceptable play by Jimmy Garoppolo. Meanwhile, the Packers, after that disastrous week one game where everybody was ready to cast them out, you want to talk about not giving a shit about what weeks one through four mean in the NFL season? Just go to the very first game of Green Bay where a Basically, they put them on the Titanic and sank them out in the ocean, uh, only for them to come back and get the number one seed in the bye week last week, right? So, you know, yeah, the Packers had a phenomenal year. They netted 13-3. and three. Their offense in Rodgers looked great. Um, you know, it looked better at times than others. You had a run game that at one point lost Aaron Jones, only to see Dylan come in and just tear it up. And now they've got them both back and healthy. Devontae Adams and Rodgers kind of got back to last season season form, you know, the question ends up being the defense. And like we had mentioned with the 49ers, you know, they they have just done it with solid defense and then acceptable offensive play, but exceptional offensive play from the run game when you consider what they've done with both Elijah Mitchell and Debo Samuel. Now, Debo Samuel ended up this year, you know, he he became kind of like the Michael Jordan of the 49ers because he just did everything under the sun. And toward the end of the year, they even got, uh, you know, good play from Brandon Ayuk who, remember at the end of last year, was a phenom. And Samuel was a little bit, uh, you know, uh, banged up and not as consistent. And then they started off this year, and Ayuk just took the in, the first three quarters of the season off. And then all of a sudden dialed it up toward the end of the year. So they finally got him involved in the offense. And Samuel, he just kept doing what he did all year long, which is both catch the ball and run the ball. And that's what they're going to look to do here against the Packers in Lambeau Field. They're going to look, I mean, it's going to be cold. I mean, it's Lambeau in... January.
February and 8-15 games, so no sun there to heat everything up. It's going to be cold. Cold Now, Lambeau is obviously heating all the rest of it, but you know you can't heat the temperature, right? So you're going to get a, a 49er team going into Lambeau playing in cold conditions against Packers team that's used to it. You have the 49ers defense, which was good, uh, you know, good in the up up front on their defensive front, uh, okay in the secondary uh, versus a Packers team that's obviously going to look to power it behind Aaron Rodgers here and air it out. Five and a half points is a lot of points. It, it really is. And if you look at what people are picking this week, a lot, a lot of experts are going with the 49ers yet again here to go into Lampo and throw the upset here versus Green Bay. I don't know. When I considered making my pick on this game, the one thing I I thought about was, much like the Tennessee Bengal game that I just spoke about, or the Bengal Raider game, I should say, that that I had similar thoughts to that game considering the 49ers last week. Because the 49ers were really mopping up on Dallas, and Dallas got back in that game in the end. Right? All the way to the controversial, terrible quarterback draw for a podcast for another time. But the 49ers didn't really close it out. And Garoppolo did not, did not have a great game. He really didn't. So now you're going to expect the 49ers for everything to go right and hopefully either get a good Garoppolo performance or overcome a shitty Garoppolo performance like they did again last week and doing so on the road in the cold in Lambeau. For me, I think it's too much. I'm going to take the Packers here and the five and a half points. The over-under is 47. Um, In that one, I do have a lean toward the um, over. I think 47 points is an easy number to get over for these two teams. Obviously, a Garoppolo implosion would not work well for the 49ers or the over. Uh, But right here, I think that the Packers are going to net that five and a half points. And I think that the scoring will be up to snuff. 49ers will be able to get some points on the board here to help both those teams get over the 47 points. So Packers and the over are my picks. The over is just a lean, but the Packers I am taking that and the five and a half. Third down. Now on to the Sunday games. The first game will be played tomorrow. The first game of Sunday, which obviously will be played tomorrow because that is what? It's fucking Sunday, dummy. The first game played at 3 o'clock at Raymond James Stadium. NBC on the broadcast. WNBC. Pig bombing. What up? What the fuck is up? Uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will be hosting the Los Angeles Rams. Buccaneers currently favored by 2.5 points. The over-under is 48. Checking out the gambling statistics, the Sharps and the money are on the Bucks. 65% of the money pool is in on Tampa Bay right now. Meanwhile, the Joes, the tickets, are going to be on Los Angeles. 60% of the tickets taking the Rams currently. Over to DVOA, the Buccaneers offense currently, well, end of the season, first on offense, they were first on the pass, fourth against the run. They did so against a pretty tough schedule of defenses, ranked second overall. Meanwhile, on the flip side, the Rams defense going up against that number-ranked Tampa Bay offense. Rams came in at fifth DVOA. They were pretty even across the pass and the run, as they were sixth against the pass, fifth against the run. Did all of that against the eleventh most, uh, the eleventh DVOA ranked schedule. God, that's a whole lot to spit out. I really should bank on the, you know, shit on the schedule part of it, but it is kind of relative because if you're posting the number one ranked anything against like the 31st ranked schedule, I mean, you did so against shitty competition. But not so here. Buccaneers offense did so against a really tough schedule, and the Rams defense did Admiral Ad, Admiral, the Admiral Darryl, David Robinson, where are you? Uh, Ad, admirable? Whatever. They did good against uh, a, a good schedule. Well, they did good against a tough schedule. Anyway, I really fucked that whole thing up, didn't I? Let's just rewind that whole thing. (laughs) Buccaneers offense, they're ranked first on the DVOA. Rams defense is fifth. They did so against decent opponents, so you have a pretty good matchup heading there on the offensive side of the ball for Tampa Bay. Now flip it over, Rams will get the ball. Their offense ranked eighth overall. They were seventh against the pass, twelfth against the rush. Meanwhile, the Bucks defense, which was really good at the beginning of the year, especially on the run side of the ball, fell down a little bit, but they came in at ninth at the end of the season, tenth against the run and uh, against the pass. That is tenth against the 
pass and 12th against the run. They were really good against the run. Everything kind of fell as the year went along. Uh, they did so against a really shitty schedule. though. It came in ranked 32nd. So there it is. There's the example that I was trying to say before. So that ninth ranked defense did so against not the best of talent. Rams offense 8th. They did that around the 18th uh, schedule. So they did that against uh, you know considerably better uh, opponents. So, I mean, it's even, depending on how you want to say that, I, you know, I, I, I want to, ugh, Jesus Christ, you know, eventually, at some point in my life, you know, doing this now three years, I think, I, you know, did first year and, and posted it on to uh, SoundCloud because I didn't necessarily want to uh, dump it right into the internets uh, before I felt comfortable with it. But even at this, it's like my third year and, I, you know, whenever you start doing these, if you're doing them solo, it just tough, like in a room by yourself, looking at four walls and a TV, and you know you you try to do it and without as much editing as possible. And yeah, sure, once in a blue moon, I will go back and I'll go back and, and edit this, that, and the rest. But I like to do it live because I came from a background where I did live radio. Not a ton of it. I did updates. I did produ- producing more than anything else, but I did a couple of weekend shows. But you like to envision that you're doing something in a live atmosphere because, look, that's you know that's where the chops are, right? You want to play with the pros, you do it in a live format. And that's what we're talking about right here. And as I said, as I'm sitting here by myself, I sometimes my mouth just starts going and the brain can't catch up. And then all of a sudden you get, which I've talked about on numerous podcasts too. That's a crutch in it itself is that I just sit there and all of a sudden I'm just like ah, fuck it anyway what I was saying was uh, that's it for the DVOA you gave those things rewind it if you want to catch whatever the stats are that I just wrote but how does that translate to the actual game. Uh, first of all, let's check out the injury report to see if there's going to be impact there. Obviously, the Rams are going to have a couple of big notes. First of all, their entire secondary is decimated. Taylor Rapp, concussion, Jordan Fuller, uh, I, he was a knee several weeks ago. Then they lost Whitworth, too. So their de- offensive tackle, Whitworth, is going to be out for this game, as are their, their secondary. Flip side, uh, for the Buccaneers, Ronald Jones, the second, he's out. Perriman, he's out, the wide receiver. You Grayson, the slot that came in to fill in for Godwin who went out. He is going to be uh, questionable as is Jensen and Wirfs. That's probably the bigger uh, names on the offensive side of the ball because they're the center and offensive tackle. So Wirfs looks like he's going to be the more questionable of Jensen. I think Jensen's going to be able to go without a hitch. Wirfs is going to be you know, I could imagine him playing, and maybe he's got to take snaps off, or maybe he doesn't make it through the whole game. That's just based on what happened last week. Um, I think Jensen is going to be able to get a little bit more out of the game. We'll see. Obviously, these injury reports are really tough to tell what's going to happen in the future, especially when some people will play a couple of days in practice week, then they won't. And then it's tough to even kind of read the tea leaves when it's related to the injury report because, I mean, who's to say that they actually could go, but they're like, you know what, we don't really need you to practice this week, so why don't you just take off and relax and let's not push it, right? I mean, even that, even the practice week report is subjective, to say the least. But anyway, there are injuries along the offensive line, which is big, especially since you look at last week and the performance. Tom Brady really picked apart that Philadelphia Eagle defense, and to do so, he definitely needs time in the pocket. He's never been the most mobile. He hasn't gotten more mobile as his age has moved along. So obviously, he'd like to get as much time as possible in that backfield. So Those two names on the offensive front. Grayson, like I mentioned, in the wide receiver slot position. On the defensive side of the ball, you have Jason Pierre-Paul, who I can't tell from what I've read if he's going to go or not, but it sounds like he's pretty banged up. Sean Murphy bunting, he's got a hamstring. He's also questionable. Now, Leonard Fournette might be coming back for this game, uh, so he will help to spell Ronald Jones Jr., who's going to be out. But also, last week, they did get some solid performance from Vaughn, so, you know, maybe... You know, Fournette isn't necessarily needed, but the more soldiers, the better, especially in a big divisional game such as this. So that is the injury report. Now let's get back to the actual gameplay. You know, Buccaneers here at home, favored by only two and a half. This is going to be my lock of the week. I am taking the Buccaneers here in the two and a half. You know, 
I was surprised last week when Philadelphia went into Tampa Bay and threw up such a stinker as they did. I, you know, I couldn't have been more wrong last week about everything. Every single pick I had. You would have thought that I just landed on fucking planet Earth and just started watching football the week before with all of the picks that I made. Because they all, every single one, wrong across the fucking board. I mean... You are a stupid asshole. That's exactly what he is. Exactly how I felt. That's exactly how I felt. I couldn't argue with either Ron or Jim on that regard. But anyway, I thought Philadelphia was going to go in there, and I thought that they were going to be at least a more live dog than eight points. And they got throttled. Throttled. And I was surprised because I thought that, you know, slay on defense, a good defensive front, that they were going to be able to go in there, and the offense with some big game, with big hitting potential, was going to be able to stay in that game, and Tom Brady just chopped up that defense from the get-go. I mean, they went in with a specific game plan, they did all underneath routes, they kept the short game going, and just moved methodically down the field, scored, before you know it, they were up two scores, and it just didn't get any better than that. So, now they're going to play a second home game here. They're going to get a little bit more health back, especially if Fournette plays. They might you know, lose a little bit on the offensive line, but if they go, point is that they should be in a similar position as they were last week. The Rams, meanwhile, are going to be going from home, on the road, cross country. Doesn't really matter. It's a 3 o'clock game, so the jet lag is not like going from east to west and playing a 1 o'clock game. They do get the two extra hours. But they do have to go to the other coast, away from home, and they're going to have to play a team that's way better than the Arizona team that they just played. Not that you need each week to be a good game or to have a competition level that gets you ready for the following week, but I just wonder whether or not having to go through such a sleepwalking Monday night game is going to have an impact on their performance come Sunday at 3 o'clock. Um, and not to mention, my other question mark is specifically on Stafford. I don't think Stafford has looked that great this year. You know, they did a lot of things right last week against a bad Cardinal team. They had some good games down the stretch, but they also had some stinkers, especially the last week of the season when they lost. I don't think Stafford is a world beater. I don't know if he necessarily has to, but I don't think he is here. Cam Akers was coming back. He was supposed to be this you know, big added bonus. He hasn't looked spectacular. He's looked okay. Dropped that really big pass when he was wide open last week, even though it was a little bit behind him. Um, you know, They do have Sony Michelle, who has played good, so they've got a little bit of a ground game going. Henderson, I think, was going to be activated from the IR. I don't know if he's going to be activated from the IR, but I don't think he's going to make it in this game. I don't necessarily think that they need him. And then you had Odell Beckham Jr. who came around big last week, which is the first showing of him in years. And not only not only did he just come back and start playing well, he brought the old OBJ fucking attitude back into that one as all of a sudden he's slamming his head, you know, he's bobbing his head up and down, screaming and yelling. I mean, it was just classic OBJ. And you're like, you know, I'm glad to see him back. And at the same time, I understand why his career has kind of spiraled out of control here because he's just a fucking nutcase. He really is. He's just nuts. And you saw it in the last game. He did a couple of things right, and instead of just being excited, happy, and content with with actually being relevant, of course, it's just energy all over the place and over the top, you know, just a boisterous personality. He just can't keep his, you know, he can't control his emotions, and you can see it. And I don't think that's going to factor into this game at all. I'm just saying that, you know, I, he is what he is, and you're not going to change it. He got involved last last week, and all good players in the NFL, the more of them that you have, the better the product is, so it's glad to see him back. However, it's not like he's been doing this for week after week after week, right? I mean, last week was probably one of his better games that he's had as the Rams, probably one of the better games he's had in their most recent past. I don't know if you can come to expect the same kind of performance tomorrow at 3, but we'll see. Bigger point that I'm trying to make is that I am not really sold on Stafford and Stafford's contribution here to the offense. He is way better than golf, Goff for sure, but I'm not sure if it's going to be enough in this game. So let's go to the defense, because if the if 
anything on the Rams gets them through this divisional game to the NFC Championship, it's going to be that defensive side of the ball. And it's going to be Aaron Darnold. Darnold. He, uh, Aaron Donald. He's going to have to create all kinds of fucking havoc, just like people that pound the, you know, the pavement that he's the best, you know, defensive player in the past 10, 15 years, which he very much could be. I will say that he disrupts a lot of games. I don't know if I've seen that defensive performance that I would expect out of such a, a name with, with such a reputation about him. Maybe this will be the game. I think it'll have to be because with Fuller and Rapp both out and now they've been banged up now for a couple of weeks, um, you know, sure, they brought people back. They did okay last week against a Arizona offense that isn't that great? And I can never get behind the short quarterbacks. I can't get behind Baker Mayfield. I have trouble with Murray. I think Murray's athleticism is way more than that of Baker Mayfield's. However, it's the same approach. It's extend the play and then try to make a big throw with the arm, right? And so that's not really a true litmus test when you're playing this game versus the Buccaneers. When it's a complete system quarterback and... Tom Brady, 20 years of NFL experience that's going to know exactly what he's looking at and is going to be able to see this defense and pick it apart if there's any kind of deficiencies, such as having backups in the secondary like the Rams do. Donald's going to have to go through there. He's going to have to tear it up, and he's going to have to create havoc. The banged-up linemen give him the opportunity to do that. I do think there's the potential for this to be a close game. I know a lot of people are back in the Rams right now, but I just don't think it's going to be enough. I think ultimately that the uh, the secondary being a question mark, I think that Tom Brady is going to be able to abuse that. I mean, he abused the Eagles last week, and they have a great defensive front. Maybe not one player as good as Donald, obviously, but... They were still able to get that done. I think they could repeat that here. If the Rams are to have success, like I said, I think that Donald's going to have to create havoc against that offensive line, jam up Brady the best he can, and then for offense, I think they're probably going to need a little bit of what they did last week. I think they're going to need a couple of plays from Stafford. I think OBJ is going to have to come through. I don't know if you're going to be able to turn around and change things around and just go all Acres and Michelle and do you know some kind of you know, you know, about face 180 and all of a sudden change up your strategy. I mean, it's not McVeigh anyway, right? I mean, it, it just simply isn't. So I think that the ground game is only going to complement the offense, and I think the offense to get through this is probably going to need some big plays here and there and uh, big performances, especially by OBJ and by Stafford. I don't think it's enough. I'm taking the Bucks at 2.5. They only need the field goal to win, so that's why I said I am locking it up. As for the over-under of 48 points, I'm going to lean toward the under in this game. I don't know if these teams are going to be... You know, the Rams did a lot last week against a Cardinal team that just basically fell apart on Monday night, which is what you saw all during Wild Card Weekend, is that these teams that didn't show, they really just fell apart. Um, I think the Bucs are going to be able to get it done. They're going to be methodic. I don't know if they're going to light up the Rams' defense the way that they did the Eagles. So I could see this being a, a much closer game, 24-20. You know, something along those lines, 44 points, that would give three, that would give four points and the under. And that's more or less how I'm thinking of this. Maybe not. Again, I, I was awful last week, so I could have a repeat performance here and stink up the joint. But I am going Bucks, locking that in as my best bet, and I'm going the under of 48 points. So that'll bring us to our final game which will be the 6.30 game on CBS. It is going to be played at Arrowhead Stadium, seeing the Kansas City Chiefs hosting the Buffalo Bills. Chiefs finished off this season at 12-5. and The Bills were 10-6. and The Bills obviously had the colossal game last week against the New England Patriots, just throttling them in what people called the perfect game. Uh, and the Chiefs, they did okay 
in their own right, but against much lesser opponent in the Pittsburgh Steelers, and a, a week a week exit for Big Ben Roethlisberger, who really had just reached the end of the line, uh, gave it all he could. Probably stayed a couple of years past what he should have, but he he tried the best they could. The game really wasn't much of a game at all, and the Chiefs won handily, just like the Bills did versus New England. So now you're going to have a much different situation here on Sunday night. Uh, Chiefs favored by one and a half, just one and a half at home. So if you're going to say that home field is three points, then people are looking at the Bills as the better team right now. Chiefs favored by one and a half over under 54 points. It is the tops in terms of the over underline at 54 going over the gambling stats. It's going to be a pros versus Joe's game here as well. The Sharps and the tickets are, the Sharps and the money are on the Bills. 72% of the money pool is on Buffalo. Meanwhile, 58% of the tickets are on Kansas City. Switch over to the DVOA stats. The Chiefs are third on offense, third on the pass, 10th in the ground game versus a weak schedule of 20. Uh, not as bad, obviously, as the Bucks defense, which was the 32nd ranked schedule. But the 20th ranked schedule, not, not fantastic. So Chiefs coming in there at third on offense. Bills had the number one DVOA defense. First against the pass, 11th against the run, but they did so against an even weaker schedule ranked 31st uh, in the NFL. Switch it over. The Bills offense ranked 10th DVOA, 13th against the pass, 9th against the rush. Chiefs defense miserable. Here's where you get probably the either the, the Biggest discrepancy or second biggest discrepancy as the Chiefs' defense is 24th. So Bills' offense, 10th. Chiefs' offense, tw- or, sorry. Bills' offense, 10th. Chiefs' defense, 24th. And there's neither side of the run of the defense for the Chiefs is solid. 23rd against the pass, 20th against the run. So it's not like you excelled against the pass so you could lean back and be like, ah, we'll shut down the pass. They were all both pretty terrible. They did go up against a good schedule. It was ranked third uh, DVOA. So the Chiefs defense has gotten uh, you know a lot of exposure to good offenses. So they'll get ready for that. That'll come in useful when it comes to 630 at Arrowhead. So injury report, uh, nothing really Really big to note: the Bills are clean. The uh, the clean. What the hell does that mean? That means there's nothing on the schedule. But that could re- really be, you know, interpreted differently. What do you mean clean? Um, anyway, Chiefs. Daryl Williams. He's banged up, but they're going to get Ceh back, so that's a positive. Um, other than that, there's really not much to talk about. It's a pretty healthy game. This is probably I, the best game on the ticket. Uh, I, I can't really think of any game that really comes close. I, I mean, if you wanted to get down to it, maybe maybe the Bucks rams game, but there's a, a bunch of injury in that game, so I don't think it's nearly um, you know, it, it's great a representation of good football as the Chiefs-Bills game. Now, you know, whether or not we get good fo- football is a different story altogether. But, uh, you know, how does it break down? In this game, again, I am going to ultimately take the Chiefs. Uh, one and a half points at home for for the Super Bowl runner-up last year, the Super Bowl winner the year before, and the Bills team right now, which is surging. And if you watched the game last week against New England, you would look at that and been like, How, what team is going to take them out? They've got to go on the road here. They've got to go to Kansas City. They're not going to be at home. They're not going to be playing in the cold weather, They're, which I thought was going to be a negative uh, on their team actually last week. And, I again, I couldn't have been more wrong because it was anything but a negative. But they are going to have to go on the road. Uh, the Chiefs here, they looked good on offense. They did not look great. Um, their defense went up against a really piss-poor Steelers team, and so they really didn't get them a good test. But then again, the Bills just mopped up on New England, and so their offense was so good and New England's defense so bad, their defense didn't really get tested. I mean, they were up so much for the entire game. I just think here, maybe the Bills pull through. Maybe this is the game that Josh Allen proves to everybody the first two years were the anomaly. He has gotten better and that his performance as of late is the performance that we'll, we will see in the future. 
Their rush game is their running game is okay. It's not fantastic. It has played better. Obviously, Allen's ability to scramble and gain yards on the ground proved to be a huge asset last week. Could prove to do the same here. If they perform as well as they did last week, yes, I do think the Bills have a chance to win. However, I'm going to go with Andy Reid. I'm going to go with Pat Mahomes. I'm going to go with what I believe to be the better coach and the better quarterback. Uh, You know, if you have a draft, Allen is good. I'm taking Mahomes 10 times out of 10, right? So I'm picking the better quarterback and the better coach. The defense is a cause of concern because they are, you know, if they perform terribly and they allow the Bills to score points like they did last week, that is going to put more pressure on Mahomes to perform the way he has as of recent. I mean, last week, what, he had 400-something yards, etc. I mean, he had a phenomenal week. He'd have to do so again just to keep up if their defense can't hold the Bills in. But I think you're expecting a lot of the Bills to go on the road here after having such a phenomenal game and be able to repeat that on the road against a Chiefs team. And you're going to you're going to ask their defense there to do something that they didn't have to do last week, which is play up against a top-tier quarterback that sometimes can make defenses look silly. Now he hasn't a lot this year. Um his play has not been near what it was in years prior. That said, the potential obviously is always there. And I think when push comes to shove, talent wins. I don't think the Chiefs' defense has near the talent that the Bills do, but I think they do have some big hitters, and I think they have players that can make big plays. And I think it'll be enough this week that the defense should be able to contain the Bills' offense enough to allow the Chiefs' offense to to do their thing, score more points. And what happens when you score more points? You win the fucking game. That was not really great analysis anywhere, shape, or form. But I guess my, if I wanted to summarize it into something that was a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, puts a little bit more fat on the bone here. Fat on the bone? Is that the fucking statement? I don't know. I'm spiraling again. Um, as I'm trying to sound smart, and I actually sound pretty fucking stupid. But truth is, I just think that the Chiefs are going to be able to win this game. And you're giving me one and a half points on the Chiefs at home for a team that has consistently been making the Super Bowl. I know they haven't had a great year. But Pat Mahomes is fucking good. And Tyreek Hill is fucking good. And Kelsey is fucking good. And you're asking a lot for the Bills defense to be able to step up and shut down all of that. And then also, at the same time, ask their offense to keep performing at such a top tier level. You know, maybe Allen's that quarterback. I don't know. I think sometimes there's a regression. I think the Chiefs have seen regression over the entire year. The Bills have been on a tear. It's good to get hot. Teams win Super Bowls when they're hot like that. You could say that the Buccaneers did so last year. They got hot. They got healthy. They ripped through. The giant teams of years past, when they won in 2007, 2000, uh, 2011, those two teams were the biggest March Madness-esque teams that you've ever seen. They did the exact same thing. So you could see that here with Buffalo where they just you know run over the competition. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think you're going to see a Bills team that uh, comes back down to earth a little bit and then a Chiefs team that just continues to move up to where they were previously. So give me the Chiefs as for the over-under. Give me the under. 54 points is a lot of points. I think the Bills are going to come down a little bit. Uh, I don't think the Chiefs are going to be able to light up their defense. So I think it's going to be a closer game than you think. So give me the Chiefs, the one and a half, and then give me the under of 54. And that under 54 is actually my over-under pick of the week. So I've got two, one best bet on the line side. That was the Buccaneers and the two and a half and one on the over-unders. And that was the Chiefs Bills under. So that said, uh, my brother was not in attendance today, but I will give you my picks uh, for our, for, well, for our, for the gambling segment. Fourth down. All right, so I got two, and that's all I got. And I will start with a little bit of a parlay action. And the parlay action, as I just blew out everybody's ears, let me bring that down a little bit. The parlay action is going to look like this. I took the Buccaneers, as I said, that was my lock. And then I took the Chiefs. I I took the what I believe to be the two best teams of the past two years, and that would be the Buccaneers and the Chiefs. Uh, They're both under field goal favorites, so, you know, you're going to give me just three points to win on both these teams at home. 
I'll take it. Uh, you know, Buccaneers against the Rams team that does have Matt Stafford. He's not a fantastic quarterback. Good quarterback, but not great. McVay's had problems making adjustments intra-game. Um, you know, they did lose Robert Woods, so they're playing a, a man down on the offensive side of the ball. They got Akers coming back. They're trying to work him in. They've got banged up secondary. I, You know, I think the Bucks have a lot more going in their direction than the Rams, and they have Tom Brady, and you only need to get a field goal. As for the Chiefs, like I said, I, one and a half points. They just have to win at home. That's basically it. This spread says to me, and you could see it from the Sharps and the money on the Bills, that everybody thinks that Buffalo is going to win this game. So maybe they do. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but... I'm sticking with the Chiefs, and I just think that their offense is going to be able to get this done. Their defense can keep the Bills you know, down enough. Plus, there's probably, be, like I said, a little bit of regression here uh, with the Bills just you know, by nature. That doesn't make any kind of sense, but that is my mentality going into it. So my parlay of the weekend is going to be the Buccaneers versus the Chiefs. As for my tease of the week, give me the Packers and bring that down to Packers getting half a point. Look, if the Packers lose this game, I mean, just implode the whole thing. Fire the floor, let Rodgers go the other way. I, I mean, you don't get 13-3 and three on the record. You don't get the first round by and then go in and lose at home in Lambeau Field to a 49er team who has Jimmy Garoppolo under center. I'm sorry. It doesn't fucking happen. The Packers win this game. And if you could take give, give me the uh, six points and get that to basically half a point in in their favor of the Packers. Well, the other way, in favor of the 49ers, I'm good with that. So give me the Packers and the six points, bringing that down to basically the Packers have to win. And then the other one that I'm going to go in, I'm just going to do a two-team tease here. Uh, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It would be a third team, but I'm just doing a second one. I'm taking the Tennessee Bengals under. I'm going to tease that up. It's currently at 47. I am going to, or 47 and a half. I'm going to tease that up to 54 and a half, and then I'm going to take the under in that one. Like I said, that was where I was leaning. Sure. Um, you know, the Bengals have scored a lot of points. The Titans sometimes have, sometimes haven't. If Derrick Henry comes down to the ground, they do a ball control offense. They eat up the clock. The Bengals have to go on the road. Burrow has a little bit of a hiccup here in his maturation process. You know, are they going to be able to get up to 54 points? That's a lot. That would, you know, the plus the six to get up to, well, 53 and a half, 54, whatever your book is. But that would then be the tied with the Chiefs Bills as the highest point total of the weekend. I also note that the unders have been coming in a ton. Last week you had, you know, three 40 and change games, and then you had the two 60, uh, 60 point games, right? Um, I think I'm missing a game in between there, but you had two games that were over 60. Everything else was in the 40s. So here this weekend, you know, are you going to get the 40 game or are you going to get the 60 game? I don't think it's going to come in the Tennessee Cincinnati game. So if I can jack that up to 54 and take the under, I'm in. So that is my tease of the week. Packers tease down. Tennessee, Cincinnati over, teased up and taking the over. The over, under, teased up and then taking the under. So if you wanted a third team to put into that tease, I am not doing that for the purposes of this, but if you wanted to throw something in there that you could do, I, you know, I, you could take the Chiefs and the Bills and you could probably tease that up to seven and a half and look at Buffalo. I, I think the Chiefs are going to be able to win this game, but you're going to take the Bills and you're going to give them over a touchdown. You know, that might be something worth considering. Again, I'm not doing a three-teamer. I'm just doing the Packers and the Titans Bengals under. But if you wanted to consider a third team, possibly taking the the Bills and teasing them up to seven and a half and then taking Buffalo. I do like the Chiefs. I do think they're going to win. But again, seven and a half uh, for the Bills who have just been on a tear. That, that's a lot of points right there. So anyway, that is the show for this week. All the best to you and your bets. I will talk to you next weekend before the games unless I get another podcast in. I am going to try now that the season's wrapping up to get more day-to-day -day podcasts in regarding you know tits and tidbits around the league. I haven't done that in quite a while, uh, but I'd like to start doing that more. Obviously, without the games on the weekends, it does give me you know more time to focus on individual podcasts, So, and that's where I'm looking to go. But uh, until then, I might get one in the week. Maybe I'll just talk to you next weekend for the games. Whatever it is, enjoy. Peace out. Uh, thanks for bearing with my uh, terrible tongue as I just uh, stammered through some of this. Uh, and I, I think I point that out a lot. <laughs>
that I stammer, and I just pointed out that I stammer, in which case that stammering, uh, you know, squared. Stammering squared, Rich Eggie, leaving you in peace. Thank you.